Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. So this video, I'm going to be giving you a summary of some factors that influence the shape of the coastline in relation to the different types of waves we find on our coastline, longshore drift, and some transportation processes as well. So let's talk about waves. Waves have the potential to generate so much energy, and that energy can be transported across hundreds to thousands of kilometers of either sea or ocean. Now, when it approaches our coastline, it's released as kinetic energy. And because of their force and their power, they can shape our coastline into some amazing landscapes. Now, when it comes to geography, there are two types of waves. The first type of wave is known as a constructive wave. Now, constructive waves are made when the sea or the ocean is relatively calm in terms of the weather that it is currently experiencing. And constructive waves can be recognised by their really low wave height. Typically, they're under one metre tall, but they have a really long wavelength. Now, when constructive waves approach the coastline and wash up onto the shore, they have so much energy. We call this swash. This means that they can push lots of sediment, sand and pebbles and rocks onto the beaches or onto the coastline. But when the constructive wave then washes back into the sea or ocean, it's lost all its energy. So it has what we call a really weak backwash. Now, because constructive waves have a really strong swash and lots of energy when they go onto the coastline, they will deposit, they will drop off that sediment, that sand, that rock onto the beach. And it will leave it there because it doesn't have enough energy to then wash it back into the sea or ocean through backwash. And this is why they're called constructive waves, because they construct our coastlines, they make our coastlines, they build our coastlines. Now, on the other hand, we've then got destructive waves and destructive waves are the complete opposite of constructive waves. These types of waves are much larger and have a lot more power and are mostly made when we are experiencing unsettled weather or storms. Now, we can recognise destructive waves because they have a really short wavelength, but they're really tall. They're typically over one metre high. When they approach the coastline, they have very little energy because it takes so long for the wave to build up its energy before it crests and breaks onto the coastline that it has a really weak swash. But where its true power lies is in its backwash. When it drags anything it comes into contact with off the coastline back into the sea or ocean. That's because it's got so much energy and because of this, they will erode our coastlines. They will pick up sand, rock, sediment, and they will wash it back into the sea or ocean. And this is why destructive waves are called destructive waves. They destruct, they destroy our coastlines a little bit at a time. So now we've got a good understanding of the different types of waves we have on our coastline, we can now start to think about how they transport material or move material from one place to another, either within the sea or ocean or along the coastline due to swash and backwash. Now, one way that these types of waves can do this and move material along the coastline is through something known as longshore drift, which is what you can see happening here. Now, longshore drift is this movement of material along the shore or the coastline by swash and backwash, so this wave action that's being generated. And if we were to draw a diagram of longshore drift, we would first think about our sea and our coastline, experiencing what we call a prevailing wind. That means when the wind blows onto the coastline and it's the strongest, most dominant wind direction, because wind can come from lots of different angles, but the prevailing wind refers to which one is the strongest, and then the direction of longshore drift will be determined 
by the prevailing wind direction. Now, in our coastline, the sea or the ocean will be transporting what we call sediment or sand or pebbles or rocks. And when the waves wash up onto the shoreline, we call this swash. And this will wash up sediment onto the coastline. And if you look at the diagram, you can see it actually washes up onto the coastline at an angle due to the direction of the prevailing wind. But when the wave retreats and moves back into the sea or ocean, it will pick that sediment up sometimes and drag it back down through backwash. Over time, this process is repeated, swash and backwash, swash and backwash, until that sediment, pebble, sand, moves further along the coastline. This tells us the direction of longshore drift, the direction the sediment is being moved down the coastline. So now we've looked at how waves transport material on the coastline, let's start to think about how they transport material in relation to the sea or ocean. Now waves can do this a number of ways. The first one we have here is traction. And traction is when we have really large boulders that unfortunately the wave doesn't have enough energy to pick up. So instead it pushes them along the coastline a little bit at a time. But for the sediment that's really fine, like pebbles, waves, when they generate enough energy, will have the energy to pick that pebble up before dropping it back down when it loses its energy. We call this saltation, where the pebble gets picked up, dropped back down, picked up, dropped back down. Then we've got really fine pieces of sediment, like sand, and these are small enough to float in our seas and oceans. So they will be carried by the water and this is known as suspension. Then we've actually got sediment that's dissolved into the water that we can't actually see but it might turn the water a bit of a different colour. We call this solution and this is where anything that's been dissolved into the water will be carried along by the waves. So I hope you found this video useful everyone and thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.